this way. Should have kicked in one of these times. <laughs> Here we go. Ready to rock and roll. Let's make sure we are live. Make sure the volume works. We are live. Volume sounds make amazing. Sure the volume works. We how's, are your, live. how's your sound? Uh, uh, I think mine sounds all right, doesn't it? <laughs> We're good to go. <laughs> To the point, informative, entertaining, and protecting the Second Amendment. Welcome back to Elster's Rifles and Reloading in part two of teaching Scott how to reload. <laughs> <laughs> See, he's supposed to be my business partner and he's not even my wingman yet. All right, I'll, I'll get it one of these days. <laughs> and we are reloading for Scott's 6.5 Grendel, your Palmetto State Armory yep. AR with a 20 inch uh, barrel. And he is using this for deer hunting, but we plan on shooting this target shoot once in a while. Yeah, I think uh, it'd be a good learning experience with that new Vortex scope. Yeah, and uh, as a matter of fact, why don't you go over that new Vortex scope? Um, the five by 24. 25. Five by 25 yep. Venom. Yep. Right. It's a new Vortex Venom. By the 25, I believe it's got a 56 millimeter objective on it. It's a FFP or front focal plane. Uh, it's pretty much got all the bells and whistles, including uh, zero stops other than one thing. That's illumination. But to be honest with you, I, it's pretty rare I ever use illumination anyway. Um, and just to quick show you for those guys that haven't seen the very first part, um, this is what his 20 inch PSA 6.5 Grendel looks like. And he is going to use that Vortex 1 to 8 power strike eagle on there for deer hunting. It's going to be great. It's SFP, second focal plane. It's going to be perfect for a deer hunting situation. And not only that, but home defense too. Um, but with that being said, if you haven't seen the very first part of this, this is part two, check out uh, part one once you're done with this live event or if this is the first time you've seen this after the live event check out part one before you watch part two here and in part one what we did is I gave Scott two pieces of brand new uh, Hornady Black factory ammunition I didn't reload it it came from the factory and that ammunition just to kind of recap on this had a factory headspace of 1.2085 and Scott fired those two pieces out of his PSA Grendel not mine not anyone else's but his and that brass miraculously grew all the way from 2085 all the way up to 217 and fire formed at 217 so that means usually I would recommend, at least for a semi-automatic, uh, an AR of this situation, to bump back the headspace roughly two to three thousandths of an inch. You know, for a hunting situation, I'd probably recommend something a little bit more liberal, maybe even four thousandths. I don't think I'd go over four thousandths. I know guys that will do five thousandths of an inch, uh, but I think anywhere is between uh, two to four thousandths of an inch from fire form would be suitable, especially for a situation like this that is for deer hunting. and. Uh, we are going for precision ammo here and the problem is is this new starline brass here and just to quick show you we've already prepped up and seeded primers on 30 of them but we purposely left 20 here for you guys uh, that way you're not sitting here all day but you kind of get the gist of what's going on um we realize that this new Starline brass is nowhere near our target headspace. You can notice that our target headspace here of 214 is well over what this brand new brass is. Matter of fact, it's well over where the factory ammo started. You can notice that the factory ammo headspace is very similar to the new Starline brass that we're using. And this new Starline brass had a, a range on the headspace of 1.2065 to 2085, it had a 2,000 of an inch difference. So what we did is we lubed up all 50 pieces and we bumped all that brass back to 2065. So they're all consistent. Every single one is exactly 2065. A couple reason why we reason why we did this is they're all consistent and they're all starting at the same spot to fire form up to 217 so we can bump it down to 214 and also we also i also recommend and everyone else does pretty much in the precision 
reloading community is to resize brand new brass for neck tension. That's the number one point of that. So, um, so that's where we're at right now. So just to go over our spec page here before we continue, uh, obviously got Scott 6.5 Grendel. We got 50 pieces, today's date. This is brand new Starline factory brass and it has roughly a headspace of, it was 2065, but we're gonna say 207. Um, this needs to be fire form. I'm, I noted that on the card and we're gonna fire form that up so we can bump it back strategically. We're using CCI 400 small rifle primers and this has a trim length of 1.509, which I'm about to do here in a little bit. For those guys that are absolutely new to the game, you know, I got the trim length out of this Hornady manual and at least for 6.5 Grendel here, what they're recommending, at least in this Hornady manual, is a maximum case length of 1.516. If your brass is over that length of 516, you are gonna run into some serious issues. You're gonna run into the potential of damaging your chamber and it's not gonna be a good day. So you wanna make sure you're well under this maximum case length of 1.516. And more times than not, they're gonna recommend that you trim 10 thousandths of an inch underneath this 516 down to 506. And it's pretty rare for me to actually go the bare minimum here. I usually do a couple thousandths, maybe three thousandths of an inch above the actual trim length. So if they're recommend, re recommending 506, I probably trim this roughly around 508, maybe 509. That's playing it pretty safe. And that's exactly what we're gonna do is we're gonna trim this brass back. Even though it's new, we wanna make sure all this brass is not only starting out at the same headspace, but also the same trim length. And that's what we're gonna get accomplished today, at least in this live part, is we're gonna trim all this brass. We're gonna take it through the Lyman case prep center here. And we're just gonna make sure that the primer pocket is uniform and we're gonna uh, chamfer and deburr the outside of the case mouth opening and the inside of the case mouth opening. And we're gonna run around the brush and see primers and blah, blah, blah. And that's our goal tonight. And thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna double check who is all already in the reloading room. And it looks like Drew Bradley is number one man. He looks like he went. And he's saying, hello all. I hope all your folks are well and healthy. Let me get some water here. And Drew Bradley saying my EP integrations brass annealer is still rolling long, strong, and I think I'm up to 20K pieces of annealed brass right now, and that is that is awesome. He say not all my brass, LOL, just fun and relaxing to do. And our very first tester, actually, Michael Deck, last time I talked to him, and that was months ago, he was well past 50,000 pieces on his EP 2.0 annealer here. And you can check out the description box below. I'll have a link to that website, www.epintegrations.com. $268 shipped to lower 48 states. And we got them boxed up, ready to rock and roll. Ready to rock. And we got, we're swimming in parts, aren't we? Oh yeah. We got yeah. more parts than we know what to do with. We're not hurting for any inventory. You're not gonna have to worry about the future, are we? Nope, we should be good to go anytime you need one. Yep. And, um, so yeah, with that being said, we also got this other patent pending product from EP Integrations, just to kind of show you here. This is gonna hit you really soon, isn't it, Scott? Uh, I think we're gonna have some here uh, next week. Yeah, and this is the, uh, you can see it's not it's not adjusted yet. I'm purposely kind of knocking all these pieces over just to kind of prove a point. This is wide open and this is an adjustable ammo block. And we're gonna sell this for $124 shipped to lower 48 states. And uh, what's really nice about this is it'll work from the smallest casing, just under 223, all the way up to something like 375 shy tack And just to kind of show you why this shine so awesome, I'm gonna type, tip all these over here on purpose. And you can see it just cinches. If you want, you can actually lock this down. That's where it gets its name, the EP Integrations uh, Lockdown Reloading Block. Or if you want, you can kind of feather this off a little bit. You can feather off ever so slightly and you can lock that top plate down or the middle plate. You can easily take these pieces in and out of this block. 
And you could see if you really, really want, say like you have some nerve damage or something and you worry about tipping over your cases, you can really, really lock this down. And look at that. There is not the slightest amount of wobble on this. And this will go from the smallest of casings all the way up to the big guns like shy tacks and i don't know if i got that brass laying around here do i uh right there i'll show you right here let me grab this so this is obviously 6.5 grendel that we have in here but if i want heck i can even leave these in here and i got uh three pieces of 375 shy tack in here somewhere so i got three pieces I'm gonna put them in here and it's gonna adjust for that not the grundle and you can see just like that it adjusts in no joke under a second and you can see all the grundles falling over but the shy shy tacks aren't I could take this out to remove the shy tacks I could do something else something like maybe oh what else we got in here we got uh, what is this uh, 300 wisdom so we put that in here and this will adjust for the 300 wisdom and this is live this is no BS see it's not moving in one bit and I can take those out and lock it right back down on the grundle that we're working on and this is going to be up for sale really soon on our website right Scott Shipping next week, hopefully. And if you want to just quick go over the details on this. Yeah, there's uh, three plates of 6061 alum aluminum, all milled on all six sides. Uh, the top plate's chamfered so that the brass goes in and out easy. Uh, we'll have, we have some stainless steel thumb screws, not pictured in this, but, oh, there, Todd's got it. So rather than these cap screws, we're going to have these nice knurled knobs, and we just got those in. And these are going to be through production here really soon, right? Probably in the next week, I think. I, I think we're going to have them out for sale. We're going to have week. some some ready to go next week. Yeah. So if you are interested in getting your hands on this, keep an eye out for our website. Make sure you subscribe. And these are coming up for sale here soon. Like I said, $124 shipped to Lower Forest States. It's a very premium product. All all three plates are built at Let me lock this down. So. Lock this down here. All plates are milled. The edge has a nice uh, chamfer on it. The inside of each square hole here that has exactly a 223 radius has a nice, you call that a chamfer, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then we're going to have our engraving on here. And like I said, these cap, uh, button cap screws are going to replace with these nice stainless steel no mops. So, yep. That's going to be awesome. I can't wait to get this going. But with that being said, let's get going on finish up the brass prep for Scott's 6.5 Grendel. And I'm going to just jump into the chat rooms here, make sure I'm not missing anyone here. If I can get past this commercial. I think uh, this is going to be the perfect setup for you. I think, yeah, I think this is going to work really well. Between really the good. two different scopes, you can flip flop back and forth. And you're going to have a lot, a lot of options. So if you're out there watching, jump in the chat room, say hello. If you've got any questions on reloading, doesn't matter what it is, let yourself be known. I'll try my best to answer it. So let's get going on this. So we already uh, prepped up, got uh, seated, I think it's 30 pieces. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Right. We already did 30 pieces, so we left 20, left for you guys, just so you're not completely bored. And so even though this is new brass, you know, I'm going to open this block up here so I can easily get them out. We still need to make sure that they're trimmed to the very same length, just so they all have the same starting point. Even though it's new brass, I always recommend still trimming it. And I did measure some of this brass. And let me get you up close and personal here. So looks like most of this brass, remember our trim length, that we're shooting for is 1.509, maybe 508. I'd be fine with that. Somewhere's in that range. I got this zeroed out. I always recommend keeping something that you know is true. I know I have this piece of 223 brass. This is exactly 1.75. So I'm just going to double check, make sure that these calipers 
are reading true. So 1.75, so that looks really good. So my battery's not going dead. Calipers are reading true. And this one's long, 512. So I'm gonna set that one off to the side here. This one here is also a little long, 510. So I expect some of these to get trimmed, but I'm sure some of these, that's 510. This one's under, so I'm pretty sure that one's not gonna get trimmed at all. And what I plan on using is the world's finest trimmer here. In this situation, I'm actually using the world's finest trimmer two, not the one, but the two, that has different inserts. And what's interesting about the world's finest trimmer two, and I know some of you guys have already seen this, but some of you guys probably haven't. You can chuck this up in your drill and you can actually pop this insert in and out. Right now you could see if I can focus in on this, it says 6.5G, that stands for 6.5 Grendel. I can actually pop this insert out and this rides off the datum line or the headspace of the brass. So when I insert this brass into this trimmer, this indexes off the datum line or the headspace. If you were to draw a imaginary line in the middle of this shoulder, that's where this index is. Now, if your headspace bumps are all over the place, your trim lakes are also gonna be all over the place. So that's where, why it's not only super crucial to have consistent headspace, but obviously for precision purposes, but also for trimming. If you're using something that indexes off the headspace, it's very, very important. Um, but like you can see here, with the world's finest trimmer too, and there's a ton of different trimmers you can get out there. Um, this is probably the bare minimum and what I would uh, I would suggest getting is world's finest trimmer two or the world's finest trimmer one. This is actually an insert for 243, so I can take this 6.5 Grendel insert out and put in the 243. You can get any flavor insert you want, depending on what you're loading for. And they give you this little chunk of wood dowel here where you can take this trim bit out, insert in the wood dowel, and you can knock that insert out and put in whatever insert you want. That's kind of where this kind of shines. It's very inexpensive and it works really, really good. Um, but one of the downfalls to it is it leaves a very jagged cut edge. And it forces you to have to manually, either by hand or with this case prep center, chamfer and deburr. And I'm about to explain that here in a little bit, if you're new and you're watching for the first time, is there's a lot of trimmers out there, something like a Groud Triway trimmer or the Groud um, uh, bench top trimmer that not only trims, but it also chamfers the burr all in one shot, saving you two extra steps that you don't have to do. Saving time in the reloading room is unbelievably valuable. And if you can afford it, they have something called, I believe it's the Henderson Precision Trimmer. It's probably the, the best trimmer, chamfer, deburr, all in one unit that you can buy. And I don't know what the price is off the top of my head, but it's very expensive. They don't give that trimmer away. I think it's something like 600 bucks off the top of my head where you can get something like this where you just buy the body which I think off the top of my head, don't quote me on this, is 60 bucks and you can get the different inserts, I think for 15 or 20, it's something like that. But what I always recommend doing is getting a parent cartridge that you keep with the trimmer that's set for your head space. And if you're flip-flopping back and forth between different inserts, whether it's 6.5 Grendel or 243, it's kind of a pain in the butt to set this up all the time. And if you have the money, by multiple, so you have you can get this set up for one casing, one firearm, because you might have two different firearms in the same cartridge in 6.5 Creamor for pure example, and one might have a little bit more headspace than the other, and they're gonna trim differently. And setting these up over and over and over and over is kind of a pain in the butt. Um, and if you have to keep on routinely setting this up over and over, it helps to have a parent cartridge that is sized with the headspace or your particular firearm. So you can actually insert this and play around with the trim bit and set it towards this parent cartridge. So you're not fooling around with this all day long. And I actually have a video on using this. If you check out my video description area, 
I have a video on the world's finest trimmers to kind of explain all that in full detail. So check that out if you're interested in this product. But like I said, if you can afford it, get something like a growled triway trimmer or the bench top trimmer. Or if you money is not an object, get the Henderson Precision. I believe it's called the Henderson Precision uh, trimmer. So, but it's very expensive. Um, so I'm going to hand this over to you. We already have this set up to trim at. Um, Make sure I got this zeroed out. I'm going to purposely pick one that I'm pretty sure it's going to get trimmed. And I believe this one was, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I think this one was the longest one here. Yeah, so this is 5111. Sorry, 511. So I'm sure this should get trimmed back to. Next thing is we've got to have our safety glasses on. I can't express that enough, especially when we're trimming brass. You don't want a brass filing in your eye. It's happened to be before. It's terrible. Also, we're about to set seat primers. And if you're seeing primers, I can't stress this enough. Make sure you've got your safety glasses on. So make sure you crush that in there really good. Um, but you can see, and I wish this could zoom in a little bit better when it's live but it's not my camera won't zoom when it's live but you can see it's got a really harsh cut on the case mouth opening now and for those who are absolutely new you're watching my channel for the first time i know some of you guys have already seen this but you can see it's got a really distinct fresh cut to the case mouth opening and we can't have that there's burrs on here on the outside of the case mouth opening that will damage your firearms chamber as it inserts into the firearms chamber and there's also burrs on the inside of the case mouth opening that will damage the copper jacket of the bullet when you go to seat the bullet into the casing itself. So we're eventually going to remove that here in a little bit with the Lyman case prep center. But right now, uh, we're going to get through these pieces here. I'm going to double check uh, this trim length to make sure we're good. And it is, so press it in there really good. I kind of, when I set that up, I got it set up to press it in there really good. Really good. So, so right there should be right around five. Uh, so this is five ten. Let me check that out here. Usually, I'll press the center really, really, really good. And there we go. 509 so i usually will set this up so i have to press it in not to the point where i'm like struggling to press it in but i want a consistent trim on all these so i kind of purposely set up so i have to pr purposely press it in quite firmly so let's try another one here um let me just quick measure this so this one's pretty long so this is 5115 so So once again, try again. <laughs> you might here try doing this rather than going like this. Go like this. So there we go. So it's five zero nine. Five zero nine right there on the money. Okay, we won't bore you the rest of these, so we're gonna get these trimmed up. You can just go to town there, Scott. And uh, after we get done trimming all 20 of these, like I said, we already got 30 done over there. Do you wanna check anymore? No, you just go to town. You know, if it's, when you're trimming your brass, it is important to try and get a consistent trim length for a couple reasons. If one piece of brass, for pure example sake, has 1.507 and the next one has say four or five thousandths of an inch above and beyond that something like 1.512 obviously one's going to have more brass length on the neck than the other one and the one that has more length it's going to have more neck tension it's going to grab the bullet tighter in regards to the other one and i know we're only talking thousands of an inch but when it comes to the precision world in regards to making precision ammunition, it all counts. It all comes together. 
not only your trim length for consistent neck tension, but consistent headspace bumps, um, your consistent feeding depth of your bullet, it literally all comes together. And when one falls, they all kind of fall. And that's where having very, very precise ammo is get so, so crucial. So um, just gonna refresh this here, make sure we're good on the comments. Like I said, if you're out there watching, jump in the chat room and say hello. Especially if you're new, you got any questions. Just gonna double check and make sure our sound is good. So what do you think about reloading so far, Scott? Thanks, Thanks, so the drill is really loud, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Right next to that microphone. Yeah. So you think the next time around you could probably do this by yourself? Maybe. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. A couple more times. I think on the next time I'm, I'm going to purposely not say anything until you got questions. So sometimes the best way to learn is just to jump in head first. And I always recommend that too, you know, sometimes you can sit there and stare and stare at equipment and stare at videos. It gets to a point where you literally just got to jump in at first and just try your best. And of course, everyone thinks their way is the best way. You watch someone else's channel, I'm sure they're going to say what I do is wrong. But, you know, it's it's all about your purpose. What, what are you plan on doing? I mean, you're going for bug hole groups or are you just hunting and you're going for minute to deer? It just depends on your, your purpose. Um, you can definitely jump down the rabbit hole in regards to doing low development and going completely crazy with equipment and getting it anally perfect. And I kind of started out new, got to that point, and then I was driving myself crazy with low development that I wasn't even enjoying my firearms. And I kind of went back to my basics and I'm just enjoying the whole process again not only reloading but actually shooting my guns and not concentrating so much on low development i mean obviously i do low development for my fire especially when i first get them but you know those those days of weighing bullets and <laughs> weighing brass and all that crazy stuff that some people do those it's kind of gone to the wayside so um all right so we got this completely trimmed up so we should be good there and I'm going to have you jump on the case prep center. This is a Lyman uh, Express case prep center. One of the best case prep, case prep centers that money can buy. Matter of fact, check out the description box below. I have one of my Amazon affiliate links down there. If you want to help support the channel, I do get a little bit of a kickback. It's not huge, but it definitely does help. Um, it's just a great do all piece of equipment for your reloading room. Not only for, you know, uniforming the primer pockets, Deburring the outside of the case mouth opening, chamfering the inside of the case mouth opening in a brush. But if say like you got Lake City brass and you need to remove crimp primer pockets, this really just does it all. And I can't advise this to the new reloader enough. Is don't quote me on this. I think they're about a, they used to be a really cheap, like 115, but I think they're more like 150, 160 dollars now. Amazing, amazing product for the money. But let me get move you guys over here while Scott does his magic over here and i'll keep on babbling over here to the right of you scott so what scott's doing here on this first stage i'm going to clip you guys out here so you can see a little bit closer so the first part of the stage here is uniforming the primer pocket what that does is it makes sure that the primer sees just below flush one of the worst things that can happen is that the primer doesn't seat below flush and actually sticks out of the brass is you get what's called a slam fire and that's not good or if it you know it just makes sure that the primer is seating at the correct depth that's pretty much all it is and it does help clean the primer pocket considerably next part here scott's doing is he's chamfering the outside of the case mouth opening what he's doing is he's removing any burrs from that harsh cut from trimming the brass you want to make sure there's no burrs on there because if when that gets inserted into your firearms chamber and there's an aggressive burr on there, it's going to continually scratch the inside of your rifle's chamber and it's not going to be good. So the next part here is he's chamfering the out the inside of the case mouth opening and he's putting a very small bevel on the inside of the case mouth opening. And what that does is just puts the slightest chamfer on there so when we seat that new bullet it doesn't rip off the copper jacket ruining the accuracy of that bullet 
And then he's gonna run it on that wire brush about, I always suggest about five times, just to make sure it, you're removing all that residue and we are um, getting all those brass filings out of there. So, so he's just gonna put that over there so we can eventually see primers here in a little bit. So like I said, if you're out there watching, jump in the chat room, say hello. I'm gonna let Scott do his thing here. It looks like good old Alaska One Andy is jumping into the reloading room. Thank you for joining my live chat, my friend. And um, I'm excited, man, to get this new <coughs> Grendel of yours shot. You've never shot a Grendel before, have you? No, I have not. Well, just the two pieces, the uh, yeah. fire farm. Yep. And Scott mentioned that his, uh, if you did, you missed that on the part one, that his 6.5 Grendel didn't cycle. Uh, it actually has an adjustable gas block on it. And it, did it eject at all or it just didn't eject it, at all? It got caught in the, it didn't eject. It didn't eject all the way not. It, it did open up somewhat. It, yeah, it did open up, it, but it didn't. We're actually pretty lucky it didn't damage the brass. Yeah. Um, Harold Farmer is also jumping in the reloader room saying good evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, so yeah, it's it's severely under gas, so we're definitely gonna have to adjust that gas block. And if you're not familiar with adjusting a gas block on an AR, uh, looks like all these PSA 6.5 Grendels, 6.5 Creedmoors, all their higher end uh, precision rigs are coming with these adjustable gas blocks. Now, I'm actually advised getting an AR with an adjustable gas block. It's definitely something that's nice to have. Um, it doesn't take that long to tune. As a matter of fact, I have a video on my video list showing how to adjust a adjustable gas block within roughly five to 10 shots. It doesn't really take that long and it's quite easy actually. So if you're not familiar with adjusting gas block, check out that video playlist area. Um, and we're eventually gonna have to do that and I plan on getting that uh, on a video. And, showing you guys in a future edited video when you eventually go out there to the range. Now, with that being said, remember this brass is not fire form. This brass headspace is so far behind what we're shooting for. And I'll just touch base with that again. This is where the two pieces of factory ammo expanded up to here. And we want to get a target headspace of 214. But well, we're way down here with this new Starline brass that he's processing right now. When we reload this, it's got a headspace of 2065. We're going to fire it, clear up to 217. And then on the second reloads, we're going to bump that back continuously every time we reload it to 214. And I don't, this very well could perform well out of the gate even with such a huge headspace difference i mean we're literally talking eight thousandths of an inch even a little over eight thousand inch and that's definitely not precision in the precision world when it comes to reloading precision ammunition for your precision rig and you know if we're shooting for a three thousand of an inch but actually we're starting out with an eight to nine thousandths of an inch difference that's a huge difference so i'm curious to see how this performs and sometimes it performs great, but the problem is, is what happens is this brass needs to literally expand eight to nine thousandths of an inch to seal off into the chamber. When that fire firing pin ignites that primer and the primer sets off that powder, 5,000, I'm sorry, 50,000 PSI of pressure inside that chamber expands instantly and makes that brass seal off. And the least amount of headspace, the faster that brass is gonna seal, the faster it can seal off, it's the less, least amount of gases escaping around the brass and out the back of the chamber. And when it has to expand eight to nine thousandths of an inch, obviously it's gotta expand five thousandths of an inch more than what we're target headspace is gonna be. And that's probably where you're gonna see a lot of uh, black residue around the case. If you see a lot of black residue on the side of the bodies, it's a good indication that you're bumping your headspace back way too much. <clears throat> and it can actually be dangerous. If you bump your headspace back, especially over 10,000 of an inch, and your brass has to expand that much 
over 10 thousandths of an inch. You can run in what's called case head separation, where the brass has to violently expand to seal off in the chamber. It has to seal. If it doesn't seal off, it's not going to force that gas down the rifle's bore and push that bullet out the muzzle. And when you don't truly know what you're doing, and you're one of these guys that thinks they can just take their full length size and die until it touches the shell plate and give it a couple turns, and you're not using stuff like bump, bump gauges, and you're not truly reloading for your firearms chamber, you're just kind of winging it, you truly don't know what that headspace is, and it can be very, very dangerous. And when you're just winging it like that, and you truly don't know what you're bumping that headspace back from fire form, and say like you're actually bumping it back 12, 13 thousandths of an inch, you're most likely gonna run into case head separation where the literal, that's what it means, the head of the case separates from the, the base or the body of the brass. <clears throat> and sometimes it can be very dangerous and explode. So I can't express that enough. Reload for your firearms chamber. Don't reload for guessing, or especially in my opinion, when it comes to bottleneck cartridges, I don't use case gauges. I don't reload for a case gauge. I reload for my firearms chamber. So <clears throat> I'm gonna drink the water here. It's like Scott's got about five or six left to go. Then we're gonna seat some primers. And um, I know you guys out there are having a hell of a time getting primers <clears throat> and i can't stress this enough when the getting's good you better stock up on primers because right now i haven't seen primers for a long long time and when you can i stock up when i can and <laughs> when i say i stock up i stock up and especially when prices are going out of whack right now I can't stress the importance of when the getting's good, stock up. And hopefully this gets turned around here soon. I would think it would have been rectified by now, but God knows what is gonna happen here in the future. I wish I had a crystal ball for some of you guys that are hurting for primers. And I know some of you guys that weren't really paying attention I always recommend during election cycle to stock pile at least a year in advance of the election because it seems like it always happens, especially in the last, oh, I don't know, <clears throat> five or six elections here. You're always going to go through tough times, and that's exactly what we're doing right now. And then I post those affiliate links on my Facebook page whenever they hit. And I've been posting a lot of uh, affiliate links on there for brass, bullets, sometimes powder. It's been a while since I've been able to post any primers. And last time I was able to get my hands on, I think I got 2,000 primers from Brown Owls with promo code for pre-COVID prices. So it's really, really important to make sure you're paying attention to my Facebook page for those affiliate links. So when they do become available, I let you guys know the second I find out. And it... <laughs> Like I said, if you're hurt for components, make sure you're checking out my Facebook page and you're following it. And I'll try my best to keep you guys informed the second those uh, components come available. <clears throat> and this is probably the longest dry spell I've seen in a long, long time. I mean, I thought this last election cycle was bad. When <clears throat> Obama first got in office years ago. Um, yeah, I just... That I think the last dry spell off the top of my head was like maybe six months. This one is making this previous one look like the worst drought known to man. Um, but firearm conventions also in the reloader room. It's saying the firearm convention Facebook group just shared your live video. Awesome. That's great. Appreciate that. Um, so Drew Bradley saying, have you ever used a primer pocket uniform or shaping tool for anything other than uh, stake pockets um so i when you say stake pockets i'm pretty sure what you mean is uh crimp primer pockets you can actually use this uh inside uh chamfer bit here to remove crimp primer pockets i actually have probably what most people use and that's called the super 600 for those guys that are absolutely new uh it's in here somewhere 
see that right here. I do have a Super 600. Um, be honest with you, I thought when I first got the Super 600 would be the end all of removing crimp primer pockets. But it's great, don't get me wrong, but once in a while I'll get one, especially with Lake City Brass, it's kind of stubborn. Um, I'll get one that would get hung up in my press. So I switched over to using the RCBS uh, crimp primer removal for both small and large uh, primer pockets. As a matter of fact, I got the other one over here. So right now I got the small primer RCBS removal tool and I got the large also. And man, does this ever work slick. When you use a Super 600, it swages. When they mean swage, it physically moves the brass out of the way. What this does, it physically cuts it out. And I, it just, for me, it just seems to create a more uniform, more smooth cut, obviously, in comparison to a I'll swager. Try to do that with one hand, so that's impossible. <clears throat> um, I highly, highly, highly suggest getting this RCBS crimp pocket removal, large and small rifle pri uh, primers, and it just works awesome. Um, all right, so we got this all set up. I've got one more in here, I think. Uh, got one more. I did it more. Did you get it? Maybe not. <clears throat> Uh, so hopefully that answers your question there, Drew Bradley. Um, so firearm convention saying I'm setting up a new Dylan press as we speak and 300 blackout. And that's awesome. As uh, he says, my fourth Dylan press and won't be the last. And, you know, I wish I kind of started out with a Dylan in comparison to my Hornady lock and load. I'm not saying it's a bad press, but I kind of wish I would have got something like a Dylan. Matter of fact, if I was to start over right now, I'll probably get something like a Dylan you know, 750XL or something like that. Um, and Drew Bradley saying, Roger that, thank you. <clears throat> so I hope that answers your question, my friend. So we're gonna move on over. I'm gonna move this uh, reloading block out of the way here. And we are going to seat some primers. So what we got here is a primer flip tray. And I think we got a little over 20 pieces here. I think we got 21 or 22. So we are using a small rifle primers here, CCI. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna carefully push this out and we got 21, I think, or 22. So I'm gonna purposely move out 20 and go past, expose 30. And I'm gonna put my finger over eight of these like that. <clears throat> Try my best not to tip these all over the place live. So something like that. So we should have about 22, 23. I think we have 52 total. Um, but you can see that this primer flip tray, if you're absolutely new to the game, it's got some ridges on it. Matter of fact, I'll hold this up to my, my microphone here. And what that does is it will, if you spin this around, it will orientate all those primers in one direction. So you can see right there. This is where it gets its name, primer flip tray. And it just gets them all in one direction here. And then what we have are some primer pickup tubes here. They have both large and small rifle primer. You can see the actual whole difference between the two. So here's obviously the small, here's the large. 6.5 Grendel does small primer, so I'm gonna set these off to the side. <clears throat> Make sure that my cotter pin is in the other end. I'm going to pick all these up. Matter of fact, if you want to do this, Scott. And that's kind of learning how to reload. So he's going to pick all those up and I'll feed all those primers into the pickup tube. And then we're going to transport all those primers down to the drop tube here of the L and L press. So um, firearm convention saying, I'm Johnny Admin of the Firearm Convention Facebook group. Hit me up later and we can network. Good to go. Good night. And that's awesome. Thank you so much. So make sure you're checking out that group on Facebook. And just, you know, Facebook is an amazing resource in regards to reloading information and knowledge. There are so many closed groups out there. If you're not on Facebook and you're learning how to reload, Man, I can't stress that enough in regards to 
joining those closed group, there's a wealth of information on those groups. So I'm gonna sneak through here, Scott. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to try and do this with one hand, which is next to impossible. And you're gonna notice I'm gonna transfer all of these primers down this drop tube. And here is my weight rod. So this is the weight rod here. Here is my pickup tube full of primers. So I'm gonna take this and flip it upside down. You notice I got the cotter pin in there. You can hear the primers drop all the way down. So I'm gonna make sure they're all the way down here. I'm gonna transfer these primers in to the drop tube of the LNL press. Now you can see that there's one primer here stuck at the very end. So I'm physically gonna push that through with the weight rod. And I'm gonna insert the weight rod into the drop tube like that and pull this cotter pin. So just like that, we just transferred all those primers into the LNL press. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna clip you guys out and we're just gonna make sure that primers are feeding. So right now you can notice there is no primer in here. So this is the drop tube. Here is the shuttle that catches the primer and moves, the shuttle moves the primer into the primer seating area. And the actual primer seater shoves, literally pushes that primer into the pocket primer pocket of the brass itself. So, how come we got one loaded in there? Huh. Right here, so this is empty right there. So I'm just gonna make sure that this is feeding correctly so you can see there's no primer. So I'm gonna run this, and physically hear it drop a primer into the shuttle and the shuttle is going to move that primer into position right there. So I'm trying my best to do this live for you guys. So let me get you guys up close personal here. Scott, I'm gonna have you. Trying doing all this live and not edit it is quite challenging. All right, so we got our correct shell plate in here for the LNL press. And why don't you go ahead and go there, my friend. So what we're gonna do is, at least what I like to do is uh, raise the ram there all the way and then go down. He's gonna press forward. I usually will put my hand here in the front, press forward nice and tight, Left, let up a little bit, give it a half a turn and press again. Then I like to do what's called the tabletop test. So he's gonna, just make sure that the primer is not sticking out too far. And I like to do what's called a tabletop test where I'll sit it down on the bench and it sits down flat and fast. And I know that that primer is not sticking out. That If that primer sticks out and that bolt comes down with force on the face of that brass, you can get what's called a slam fire. And what will happen is that primer will ignite that powder before it's even in the chamber and it will explode, it's not good. So just make sure that your primers are seating just below flush, not right at flush. And when I say ever so slightly below flush, we are talking like a thousandth of an inch, two thousandths of an inch just below flush, it's super important. Once you get to this point, I like to do what's called babying your brass. You gotta make sure that you don't drop this or you just wanna make sure you don't dent the case mouth opening. If you dent this case mouth opening, when time comes to seat that new bullet, you will shave copper off the jacket of that bullet. So it's really important to baby that brass when you get to this point. So I'm gonna let Scott do his thing here. And like I said, if you're out there watching, you're new, um, jump in the chat room, especially if you got any questions on reloading, I'll try my best to answer them here for you. But like I said, we are gonna have these EP integrations, lockdown reloading blocks here for sale, most likely next week, I'm thinking. I'm kind of spilling the beans here. I have a privilege of watching the live events. So if you're trying to get your hands on that reloading block, 
Um, we're, we're pretty confident it's going to be next week or most likely the following week. Well, definitely, we're going to have them sometime next week, some of them. Yeah. And uh, we got a, a good quantity of them coming. Um, I'm not going to spill the beans of how many we're getting produced in the very first batch, but it's a lot. Um, and we're excited, uh, especially for our second product being on our website. It's it's an amazing product. It's hard to explain until you actually use it. It just, you don't have to hunt down that reloading block anymore. It just adjusts to whatever you need it to be. Like I said, you can lock it down. You can feather it off a little bit. If you want to easily take that brass in an hour, or if you really want to lock it down and then loosen it up later, you can do that too. Uh, that's just where this thing really, really shines. And that's why we're so excited to bring it to you guys. Um, but, you know, Scott and I were both, Scott was mentioning that he just got the Vortex Venom 5 to 25 uh, scope, the one that just came out. And I also got the same exact scope. And um, I think we're going to also do a video review on that Vortex Venom, the 5 to 25 together uh, using his Grendel. And I'm not sure what I'm going to mount that up to on one of my firearms, uh, probably my 223 because it's so cheap to shoot and things so damn accurate. Uh, matter of fact, if you just missed my last video was with the Arcan Optics uh, 6 to 24 with a 50 millimeter objective, 34 millimeter tube. And man, the groups on that last video I just posted was insane. I don't know if you missed that or not, but you can definitely check it out after this live event. These are at 100 yards. This is a three shot group. Uh, I believe this averaged a little over a quarter minute of angle. And, you know, this was just a kind of a cheesy tracking test. Um, but some of these groups, like under quarter, under quarter, I think this was 0.13 or something. This is all five two shot groups here average, I think, 0.36. I mean, that, that firearm is just an absolute, absolute laser. And I was actually quite impressed with the accuracy of that Arcan Optics 6 to 24. About the only downfall I kind of really didn't like about it was it, the scope shadow on it. The eye box was kind of unforgiving. I mean, you ever so slightly move your head to the left or right, and you're instantly running the scope shadow. I mean, it doesn't give you much leeway uh, for your cheek weld. And it's kind of a kind of a negative downfall, I thought, a little bit. And also, there's a lot of you know color issues on the higher end part of the magnification some pretty milky glass but you know once again it's a 449 dollars scope a front focal plan it's kind of a rarity nowadays um but i think so far we're initial in thoughts on that vortex venom the 525 we're really really impressed um but yeah we're getting onto the nitty-gritty here and once we get done seeding these primers, we're probably gonna wrap this up. So if you got any questions, make yourself be known. Uh, and then next part here, part three of reloading live for Scott's 6.5 Grendel. Um, we're gonna be dropping powder with the FX120i with the V3 um, auto trickler powder drop uh, assembly. And not totally sure what powder uh, we're going to use but we are definitely going to be using these bullets and that is the ELD match the 6.5 123 grain ELD M's and also being that we're actually loading this for Scott as a deer hunting rifle we're going to load up the same grain weight but an SST is more of a, a hunting flavor bullet here for Scott and Obviously, we'll be using these here with this one to eight power um, Vortex Strike Eagle for deer hunting. And then we're taking those bug hole groups with this Vortex Venom 5 to 25. We're going to use these DLDMs. It's going to be exciting. I I got Varget. I got X, XBR 8208. And I got some H4350. I'm just going to have to look at my book and see what type of powders we're going to play with. But that's what we're going to tackle in the next part of this video series, part three. Powder selection, dropping powder, and then obviously seating those bullets to the Forrester Coax Press, and it's going to be awesome. So we got this all done. Um, Scott, I think we'll leave those in there. Um, actually, we can probably go ahead and load them up in the EP reloading lockdown block now that we're going to be um, 
dropping powder here in the next part. But otherwise, that's it. And we're going to wrap this up. Like I said, if you got any questions, let yourself be known. Otherwise, we're going to head out here. And we'll see you guys in part three. And after that will be an edited video. Take it easy.